I'm Mark Egan, and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi, and welcome to for BassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. You know, a lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created for BassPlayersOnly.com for adults who want to play bass because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music. Never too old to groove. For BassPlayersOnly.com, let's play bass. My guest this week is Mark Egan. Mark is an old friend of mine. We go back, it's got to be over 30 years at least. He is a Grammy-winning bassist, and he's recognized and acclaimed for so many things in so many different musical scenarios. Like a lot of people, I think I first became aware of Mark during the early Pat Metheny days when he was with that band. We also have that University of Miami connection. Even though we didn't go there at the same time, we still somehow have that connection. Mark has performed and or recorded with geez, David Sanborn, John McLaughlin, Larry Coriel, Pat Martino, Jim Hall, and in very different circles, people like Roger Daltrey, Carly Simon, Cindy Lauper, Sting, Joan Osborne, Duran Duran. Mark's bass can be heard on a lot of movies and TV shows, including Aladdin, The Color of Money, Horace Line. CNN Headline News, NBC Sports, and All My Children. How's that for a wide swath of stuff? <laughs> Mark runs his own label, Wave Tone Records, and he's released a whole great big bunch of outstanding records. No two are the same. His latest release is called Cross Currents. Hello, Mark. Welcome back to ForBassPlayersOnly.com. Always great to see you. Hello, John. Thanks for having me. Great to see you, as always. I love getting together with you. Likewise. Uh, congratulations on another outstanding release. I've been listening to Cross Currents a lot over the last couple of weeks, and I really, really like it. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Now, I, I hope this doesn't come out wrong, but when I put on a Mark Egan record, I'm never sure exactly what I'm going to get. I think you're known by a lot of people for your, your fretless work and your solo work. That's it's kind of your signature sound, but you've also been known to play some funky R&B and soul and sometimes almost like straight out rock and roll. And all those records you put out, like I said, no two are the same. So Cross Records does represent a pretty good cross section of musical styles. So tell me how it all came together. Yeah, well, it, it is true that none of my records are the same, which t for me is a good thing, because I'm always, I come from a, a wide variety of influences. So when I'm thinking of a project, I'm working on different ideas and concepts. And so it, it, for me, it's good to keep changing a little bit. But I think, you know, the thread of, of my uh, sound and what I do on bass comes through, but in sort of different contexts, like... Sometimes uh, I've done a trio record with John Abercrombie and Danny Gottlieb, which is very ECM records. If some of you might know that record label, it's a European record label. But um, from that to this record, which is more R&B roots groove and sort of in the bottom end. But on the top end, there's still a lot of melodicism with my basses and with Shane Terrio, who's a guitar player. And... Um, the way this came about, I've played with Sean Pelton, the great Sean Pelton drummer, New York session player. He's been on Saturday Night Live playing drums for 30 years. But that's really the tip of the iceberg for Sean's playing because he's played on so many people's records, um, Sheryl Crow, to the, the list is really, you might have the list. I don't have it right in front of me, but he's he's played with everyone. And we have done a lot of session work in New York together a lot. Um, and over the last about 10 years, I've been playing with the guitar player, Shane Terrio. And what triggered or what the light bulb went off for me for doing this concept was right before 2000, right before the COVID shutdown in 2019, late in the fall, I did a gig in New York um, with a poet whose name is Frank Messina, very creative poet and 
I had done things over the 80s and 90s with him. And basically what it was, was he would call people to play, no music, but he would make a set list of areas that he wanted to cover. Like, okay, I want this to be a samba in the background. I want this to be a swampy funk thing. I want this to be completely free. And now I'll do, it was all varied. So it was very challenging and fun. And I come from that background as well, from having played with Gil Evans and played a lot of experimental music, especially when I was with you down in Florida, um, seemed to be an experimental period for me in a lot of ways. But this one gig we did, I had recommended Sean and Shane and to play on this gig with the poet. And at one point during the night, it was a pretty big uh, orchestration. There were two keyboard players, percussion, Arjun Brugman was playing uh, tabla on that. Yeah, you did a record with him too, like two records ago, I think. Yes, exactly. We did a record called Dreaming Spirits and Shane, the guitar player, played on that. So yeah. that was the first time I got to really go in depth with Shane as far as what his capabilities were, which are really deep. And he's such a fantastic player. But during that gig on the 19th and 2019, at one point in the night, we ended up, we were just playing trio because Frank wasn't reciting any poetry and it was just drums, bass and guitar. And I said, whoa, this is happening. This is great. I want to do something with this, this trio right here. This is great. So that was the sort of the uh, seed for it all. And then when it came time, I did, after that record you mentioned, Dreaming Spirits, I did a duo record with Danny Gottlieb which is called Electric Blue. And right after that is when I was starting to think about doing another solo project. And that's what I wanted to do. So I started writing with those people in mind. And well, that's, that sounds like a natural how it all came together. And by the way, great, great chemistry between the three of you on this record. I love it. Okay. Is that, uh, would you say that's atypical for how you do it? Because you've got a, a you know pretty big library and you've got different, ensembles different instrumentations do you do you write the music and say in general not in this case but in general you say you know so and so would be perfect for this song or for this record or do you pick the the people and then write something that will go well with the uh you know the selected personnel um generally i like to pick the the group that I want to focus on and the players that I want to do it with. And I write around them because I know their capabilities and I know what, what they can do. And, and I gear it towards them. So I'll, with that in mind, this was a trio with drums, bass, and guitar. And um, Shane had sent me some of his songs because I was looking to do other people's songs as well as writing my own for this. He sent a few songs and that, I, I liked them a lot and I worked with him. We co-wrote a song called Big Sky and he wrote a song called Poncha Train. And uh, I can't remember all the names. I have them written down here. <laughs> Homebrew and Sunflower. Yep. And um, so we, we it started to come together in that way. We were exchanging ideas and songs and I knew that Sean would be playing on it, the drummer. And um, that was the impetus for it. And then I started listening to some of Shane's records to get ideas. So it was sort of a cross-pollination going into what the other players had played on their records, Shane's. Um, try saying Shane and Sean at a recording session for, for three days. <laughs> I love those guys. Uh, they're great. But um, so that it was, it comes from the musicians in mind first, I would say, and then I write for that ensemble. And that's pretty much the way it's been for most things. Okay. I could see that going one of two ways. Cause, cause one, you can say, I want to work with these people. Let's get together and see if we can get into some trouble together. But at the same time, it's, for me, it'd be kind of hard to, to pick some musicians if you have no idea what, kind of record or what kind of music I, I suppose it can go either way Wh which was it in this case um well i had played with them and i knew oh. what they did so i didn't have any um question that, about what their abilities were because i'd recorded with shane on that record dreaming spirits and i'd recorded a lot with sean in many many different uh, instances so mm -hmm. i i 
if I was to go, if I was to just think of players that I've never played with before and then try to do that, that would be a different thing. And I probably wouldn't do that. Okay. Cause I, I'm more comfortable with people that I know that I've played with and that I, you know, enjoy or, you know, some, I'd love to do a record with Dennis Chambers sometime and we've played together a lot. So, you know, I, over the years, but um, pretty much I, I have a, a good idea of the players that I'm going to be working with. Um, even if I haven't played with them, I've listened to them a lot. So I did, feel like I know they're playing, you know. Did you know Dennis Chambers plays bass also? Yeah, he plays some funky bass. <laughs> I gave him one of my basses. Um, and oh, he's incredible. I was at one of those Warwick base camps in Machnerkirch in Germany. Mm -hmm. And Steve Bailey's all excited. Oh, you're not going to believe what's going to happen later. We're not gonna... and, and, and I saw this base. It looked like a star base almost. I said, is Bootsy Collins here? He says, I don't know. I don't know. You'll have to. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Dennis is playing drums, and then he got up, and he started playing bass. And just like you said, it was uh, it was funky. That was uh, Yeah, cool. he's a, he's just a, such a great musician. And, yeah, he's. I remember doing gigs with Bill Evans' group, and Dennis just picking up my bass and playing, you know, and just, you know, jaw-dropping yeah. playing, you know, really great. Let me ask you something else. Uh, you, you're pretty prolific with your records. Do you do you just write the music and say, okay, I've got to record this because, you know, I've, I've got, uh, you know, a bunch of songs and a bunch of music and I'd really like to get it down. Or do you say, you know what, I'd like to set some goals and put out a new record every however often one year two years something like that i you know i remember talking to you at a nam show and i was said i'm going to do a record every year i remember we we said that I and remember, i remember that yeah and um i forgot I, about that but now i remember yeah yeah and so i'm averaging about every 3 years because that's about how long it takes me to run through the whole cycle of one record with doing you know preparing the record writing the music, recording it, mixing it, and then releasing it and doing all the promotion. That takes about a year and all of that. And then I need another year just to do other things and come up with some ideas. But, I, you know, every couple of years, you know, one or two, three years for me is um, I sort of time it. I'm ready to do another one already. I just did this, but I feel like I've I've already done it. I've gone through it, but I need a little bit of a rest for it. But when I do get around to writing and getting ready for a record, I I use a little recorder. It's in my uh, iPhone. It's got, what's it called? Memophone or something? It's oh, just, uh, yeah. It's a voice memo, I think it's called. Voice memo, yeah. And so when I'm in the writing mode, which is a different practice mode than practicing bass and technique for me it's you're i'm more working on ideas and what i do is i just turn the memo on the, the recorder on and i'll just if i have an idea i'll play it and i I write down or say as much as i can about it okay this is the bpm is the tempo is this i'm hearing this type of groove and i'll sing the groove and i'll say this would be good with this or just as many ideas because if i don't say all that when i play it back i'll say what was i thinking <laughs> And so I had about six or 700 of these little ideas. And a lot of, of this record came from those little ideas. And what I do is I keep extending them. And so it might be like the tune cross currents was one bass line. Boom. That was in my voice memo. I have it here. And I did that. I write down what key it was in. And so I, I liked that and I thought that would go good with Shane and Sean because Sean or Shane, the guitar player is from New Orleans and is a very, uh, he's got really deep New Orleans groove roots as well as jazz roots. And, you know, along the lines without limiting him at all to someone like John Schofield or something. He's a great jazz player and very, has a lot of depth in his harmonic knowledge. So, um, I, I thought of that particular line. So that became the the line for it. Then I modulated it down a, a whole step and then back up and then and then came to a bridge. And and so that's the I come up with the basic groove and keep extending on that. And then with this record, I also did as much pre-arranging as possible. 
pre-production because we only had three days of recording to record 11 songs. That's a lot of music, yeah. you know, in three days. And we locked out at Power Station New England studio in Connecticut. Uh, we had one day of rehearsal before. And um, basically we went into the rehearsals with full-blown charts with what were flexible arrangements, but were pretty much, I knew what the timing of the the song was going to be and this where the solos were. And we switched those things around in rehearsal. But um, to do an ambitious project like this in three days with so many songs, you really have to be prepared for it. Or you could do a completely different thing and just go in with some lead sheet heads and just scramble in the studio and hopefully come up with something. And so many great records have come to fruition from that, you know, all the jazz great records you know they weren't so planned out but i found that with this especially with this type of record where it's a trio and we played trio and we left a lot of room for solos and the solos were live for the most part and we wanted to orchestrate it with guitar overdubs i played bass melody overdubs sean the drummer played some percussion overdubs um a couple of uh, snare drum things, but that was basically it. But so the, it was somewhat produced in the studio. It's not just a raw trio playing. It's it's a trio plus, in my ears, what I thought I really would like to hear if I was going to orchestrate that trio. So that's how I was thinking about it. Yeah, you remind me of a, a couple of things. But at University of Miami, they used to bring in people you know, get Brian, Dave Liebman. People say, "Are you related?" Like, no, no, it's a long story. <laughs> I did ask him one time. I said, "My name's Liebman too." He says, "Yeah, where are you from? Where are you from?" I could. And we couldn't trade. We couldn't right. find. I, I said, "So if somebody asked me for related, can I just say yes?" He's, "Yeah, yeah, sure, sure." And um, oh, uh, Randy Brecker. And one time, uh, you know who Bobby Watson is, the sax player. Sure, I was in school with Bobby. Yes. Uh, he was telling a story about doing an album with Art Blakey and they all get to the studio and everybody gets set up and Blakey's all ready to play. And he turns to the band and he says, okay, anybody got anything? <laughs> it's just like total opposite end of the spectrum from what you just described about all the pre-production yes. we got to get it done. But his point was, you know, if you, if you have some tunes in your arsenal and you can pull them out, sometimes that's a good way to get into, uh, you know, getting your music recorded. So that's Yes. And I think with this trio, with the uh, Cross Currents trio, um, we could have approached it that way and it would have been a, a very different record, but it would have been very interesting because there... You know, Shane and Sean are very serious players. They did their homework. They had great ideas. They brought so much to the table that I didn't even have to say, you know, like as far as adding ideas, try this. What about this? So, uh, but that is, that's a great story about Art Blakey. And I think Miles Davis did a lot of the same where, that you know, he'd ask Wayne, hey, Wayne, bring some of those songs you have in your book. Remember that? I think he, in the uh, Wayne Shorter movie, I, I read that or something. Uh, yeah, well, I've interviewed uh, over 800 bass players and uh, I've interviewed a lot of bass players who've played with Miles. And, uh, so Ron Carter, I just interviewed about six months ago and Marcus Miller and uh, T.M. Stevens and uh, trying to think of it. And, and, and I said, everybody's got a story. What's your story about working with Miles? And, nice. and he would go in a, in a different room. He'd have them over his house, but he'd go in another room and he'd listen because he didn't want to be there because he thought if they saw him sitting there, you know, that would be intimidating or they wouldn't open up. And there was one time Marcus was telling a story. He said, I, I just want you to play two notes, you know, just play F sharp and G. So he's playing F sharp G F sharp. G. Said, what are you doing? What are you doing? He says, Are you told me to play two? No, don't do that. Do that. And then he, he kind of yelled at the band and walked out and then he winked at Marcus while he was on the way out. So <laughs> who was it? Daryl Jones, he's got, you know, so yeah, Miles was uh yeah, the, there's very different approaches to going into the studio. I remember watching a Beatles documentary, and when George Martin first came on the scene, he says, Why don't we just go through and we'll just whistle through all of your songs in one day and see what we've got and we'll start there so i guess whatever works for whatever situation is what you do yes yep and you know 
the record Dreaming Spirits that I did with Shane and and um, Arjun, the tabla player, that started out as more improvisations and then we orchestrated on top of that. So that was one of those things where we just went for the moment and then worked on it and stacked things on top of it. You so. get such a great sound out of your bass on all your stuff, but this one is freshest in my mind because I've been listening to it. Tell me about your your basses and your gear and your effects and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm still playing Padula basses. I have in back of me right there and there, the two Padulas, the five string uh, MVP5, their signature series of mine that Mike made. And uh, with D'Addario strings, XL 110s. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the two bases on this new record. And most of the things that I've been doing lately I also play Marlowe bases. I was going to ask you about that. Gerald Marlowe. Yes. Beautiful instruments. Beautiful, beautiful. And um, I have, I haven't recorded with any of them, but I do play with them a lot. And this uh, Steinberger right there is an NS five string, which I play a lot. Mostly at home. I just play, you know, upright walking and, just for the sound, I actually write a lot on that because of the flavor of the sound of it just inspires different things than an electric bass would. And I, I love the sound because I did play upright a lot. I would in Miami. Didn't know that. I know don't really think of you as an upright player. Yeah, I studied with Lucas Drew at the University oh. of Miami. So did I. Yes, yes. And a uh, great teacher. He's a classical teacher, uh the Samandel book and just a great, great teacher, but I played also, an orchestra there too. I played in a youth orchestra because I felt like I needed to get a little bit happening with the bow. I played with the French bow, um, and then I studied with Don Kaufman. I, did you study with Don Kaufman as well? Yeah, yeah, he was one of the main reasons I chose Miami. Really, I How looked at you? seven schools before I chose Miami. Interesting. Uh, and what years were you at Miami? I was there in a graduate program. So I was there two and a half years from January of 84 till the spring of 86. Okay. Yes. Um, so you knew how great of a school that was with Ron Miller and Witt Seidner and everybody who was there. Ron Sani and, and Vince Maggio and Gary Lindsay and, uh, you know, and the, the the guys I went to school with Steve Bailey and, and Andy Timmons and Matt Benelli and, uh, Boy, yes. Yeah. And and all the, the guys from the sound machine. Yes, you know, Matt's a great bass player. Yes. George, yeah, George is gone. George Casas. Yes. Yeah. But uh yeah, that was uh, uh Miami. I look look back on those years very, very fondly. Me too. That was re really big growing years for me, the early years for me, big time. Yeah. So uh anything else as far as your your gear? Getting back to the gear, um, well, from out of the bass, when I'm recording, um, I play through Mark bass amps. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I'm recording, I go through first of, uh, actually, I, I, for some melodies on this new record, I used a uh, dispatcher, what is it called? Um, it's a combination digital and reverb. And then I used a, into an old fashioned TC electronics stereo course and that i got a sound with that when i was starting to do the melodies on this record i said whoa because it, it just was like butter i just couldn't believe it so that was that's what I'd, i would set up each song to quarter notes with the delay so you get repeats if it was a if it felt like it needed any delays and then i had a little bit of reverb and i print with that reverb and delay and and chorus that's and then out of that i went into a stereo uh, radial JDI um, passive direct box, and then that goes directly into um, whatever the converters are or mic trees. That sounds like a pretty bold and almost dangerous way to do it if you have the effects on there already and you're recording, if you want to tweak them. I guess if you're doing it long enough and you know what sound you're going for. It's yeah, for me, I... I because it inspires me to play a certain way rather than getting set up with some plugins, you know, as auxes, whatever, and doing it to match that to what I played with the track. I prefer, I have confidence in 
I spend a lot of time getting the sound and making sure that it's going to translate and it's going to be okay. But actually all my records, I've played it that way, you know, with live effects going in. I prefer that. Yeah. Well, you make a good point because uh, if, if you actually hear what it sounds like, that could affect and inspire the way you play it. That does, that's a good point. That makes sense. Yeah. And actually to have to rebuild it, I wouldn't want to have to go back and go through my pedals again, because those are the sounds that I like. Yeah. Cool. So, oh, th that that box is by Earthquaker. Oh yeah, and it's called Dispatch. It's a white pedal, and I first saw that um, Vic Juris, the fantastic guitar player, the late Vic Juris, had that. I was playing some trios with Carl Latham drums and Vic Juris, and I saw that, and I said, "Oh, that's nice." And it's just it's a combination of delay and reverb all in one pedal. Um, it's clean. And you can, it's for melodies, it's great because you can just dial in a little bit of delay and some reverb, to, you know, for the type of melodies that I like to do. For the groove bass, I most of the groove bass on the new record is just straight in. There's no effects at all. And uh, with, it's tricky doing two bass parts on a record where you have the groove and then the melody on top or the groove and the solo, melody and solo, you know. So I really had to pay attention sonically when I was playing the melodies to stay way down on the range of the bass, to play low and play the groove and not be up in the same range. Sometimes they cross over, but it's it's good. It, it adds a little bit of tension and excitement or whatever. Yeah. Well, that's a good lesson for bass players to, you know, don't don't I always say don't don't get fired for noodling around up here when you should be taking care of business down here. Exactly. <laughs> and I had to take care of a lot of business with playing with Sean Pelton because he laid the groove down so hard. He is a monster groover. You know, yeah. you'll hear, you've heard it on the record. I think you, you would agree, right? I mean, he's just, Absolutely. he's so solid. So that That's really cool. inspired me. And, you know, it was interesting because we've all played with many different drummers, but Sean, especially when he came to the sessions, he had studied the music so much and not that he played the demos exactly, but he knew what his parts were going to be for the most part. And so when he went to the bridge, he had a kick and snare pattern that he had been working on that he knew about. And all that, I just had to follow him and it was right. You know, it's interesting about listening to a drummer. I'm sure you talk about that with your lessons and, um, it's it's so important to listen to the drummer. And and all I had to do was listen to what he was doing. And I actually said, where are you going to be playing in the kick and snare on the bridge? He goes, he had this pattern, do do ba, do 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 ba, or whatever it was. And, you know, you know how it is as a bassist. You know, sometimes when you get into a situation playing with people, you're trying to figure out, well, what bass line should I play here or, or there? And, you know, it's such a, an important thing to play with the drummer and it sounds redundant to say but it's 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 the whole foundation of the whole group you know it's, yeah, yeah it's like it's a given but it doesn't hurt to be reminded of it too yeah if you just watch the what if you stand as a bass player and just watch this drummer play and watch a kick yeah. snare and hi-hat you know there's a lot there to pick from to choose a line to go into it the drummer almost has to be an octopus too. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, that yes. Well, let's let's take that a little further. I had asked you last time, you know, for bass players only, it's primarily a bass instruction site, and I've got students from and now pretty much all fifty states and about fifty sixty countries worldwide. They're coming to for bass players only every day to learn bass. And I asked you about what advice you had in the last interview, and I really liked what you said. You, you said there's so many great players now that were inspired from, you called them the grandfathers. You were referring to like, you know, Jamerson and Duck Dunn and I don't know, Larry Graham. So instead of only learning from the people that learned from them, go straight to the source, go to the grandfathers, which I thought was a great point. I, I want to hone in a little bit on the question now. Uh, most of the students that I'm getting are adults in their 50s, 60s, 70s. I've got a couple students in their 80s now. Yay, go. 
Yeah. And mostly men, but I am getting a few women. Actually, one of the one of the people in their 80s is is a woman, as a matter of fact. She just turned 80. Mm -hmm. But um, I say that just to set a context. They're not all trying to be uh, you know, rock stars. They're not trying to get a career in music. They just want, want to play some classic rock riffs with their buddies or some blues shuffles or some walking bass, maybe get better at reading and, and those kinds of things. And as some of us know, when we get into our 50s, 60s and beyond, things like arthritis and tendonitis creep in, and sometimes you have to deal with those things. So what I say to that is, you know, you don't have to be, you know, a contortionist. You don't have to be Stu Ham or Billy Sheehan. Or, you know, you can lay down a super simple bass line and make the music groove and make it feel really good. So I'm telling you all this just to give you an idea of who we're talking to and who we're talking about. So with all that in mind, Mark, what advice could you impart to somebody like that who wants to learn bass? What should they be thinking about? What, what questions should they be asking? What should they be striving for? Yeah, it's, it's such a good question. And I, I still go back to listen to the originators of a certain style, whether it's James Jamerson or... Jocko, um, or, and all the great upright players that have played as well, um, from Charles Mingus, Scott LaFaro, Jimmy Blanton, you know, going back. It's something that I realized when I went to the University of Miami in 1969 to study music, when Jerry Coker was there, uh, I was made aware of the lineage of jazz of where it all came from and the subset of that, or, you know, if you take the family tree of all the different players that played with everyone, I especially was interested with the bass players and where things started and where they went and how things progressed. And I still say that's a great place to focus uh, and, and not just to stay in the past, but to listen to players as they progressed in different styles of music, going from, you know, you had Dixieland to bebop to post to the Miles Davis area in the 50s jazz into the more experimental, when I sort of got into it, which was around 1968, 69, 70, 71, which was Bitches Brew and <laughs> Miles in a silent, Miles Davis in a silent way. And then Mahavishnu was coming out and Tony Williams lifetime experience and Chick Korea. And so, okay, you had people that weren't that now you had Stanley Clark, who I started listening to very heavily. And he was influenced by the early upright players, but then Stanley took it to a different place and all the different bass players. But I'm I'm I just am very interested in listening to the way that it evolves and where it comes from which isn't to say to just forget about any new player that's happening that happens to be a virtuoso. I say, listen to everything. And I listen to a lot of Indian music as well. I listen to a lot of Veena music, which is a beautiful stringed instrument with a, it's like a fretless neck, but it's a, a, like say, a sitar. Say it again. What's the name of it? Veena, V-I-N-A. Like, no. like Vino. I know Vino, uh, but I don't know Vino. <laughs> and there's, a, there's an amazing... Vina player, his name, he, I think he passed away, is S. Belashandar. And he has many records. They're Indian records made in India. And he's, he was uh, an Indian musician and it's solo Vina. And I've gotten a lot of my, the inflections that I do on fretless bass from listening to that music. And um, so, it you know, it's not just going back to Jameson, but it's going back to players like, S. Balashanda or playing a Vina, you know, I'm just, it's, that's just what I hear. That's just, I, that's what I'm enamored with. I, I just say, wow, that's so beautiful. What is he doing? How does he get that sort of vibrato like that? And so, um, you know, getting back to how that would relate to your students, if you hear some music that you like and you want to play it, you can just break it down and focus on different parts and focus on the bass line and, now there's, as you know, and I hope everybody knows, there's great ways to, you can slow it to half time. Yeah. 
I've got that on my site for bass players only. Okay, good. You could also speed it up. You could speed it up if you want to get going, and it doesn't change the key, the pitch. Right. I've got two tracks on most of the lessons now, one with bass and one without. So you could either play along with me or you can you fill in the bass part. That's great. That's so great. But for me, it was, you know, and, and to date myself, I was born in 1951. So, um, but I grew up with record players. So I used to take the needle and I remember when Heavy Weather, Weather Report came out. I bought the record. I turned on Teen, Teen Town and I said, oh my word, I have to learn this. So I had to do it lifting the needle and putting it, you know, just getting one little phrase, you know, getting a four bars and then getting that and then going on and then playing along with it and getting it further and, get, and getting it on my instrument. And then I wrote it out because I could write music. And so to me, that is the best way to learn is to really find music that you really like and transcribe or play along with it. Um, and if you can slow it down, slow it down make little exercises out of the if whatever idea it is that you're playing. Cause I'm always doing that. If I'm practicing something inevitably it becomes an exercise and then I'll try to play it in all keys or in different positions on the neck. Um, because as we know, as bass players, there's C's all over the place and there's, there's all the notes in different positions. Um, the and symmetry. when you realize, those patterns that are happening. And when, you know, interesting, when I first started to play bass, I was originally a trumpet player at the University of Miami. Remember. And I, when I switched over to bass, I sort of got very scientific with it. I was studying with Don Kaufman, just yeah. privately on the side, because he wasn't a teacher at the university oh. at that time. He just taught privately at his house. And I drew um, a fretboard on a piece of paper I, I did a, a bunch of diagrams, block diagrams. So I drew four strings with frets, 24 frets, and I made six of them on a page. And I took all the different minor and major scales and I put little dots where they were. And I saw these patterns and I said, oh, wow, it's there. And how can I connect up to there? So I had these pages of all these patterns that I did on my own just because I was curious. I already had a knowledge of music on trumpet because I was a professional trumpet player. And so I transferred it over, but um, it was that um, inquisitiveness that made me want to say, well, wow, how, what can I, I can play that there on the bass and play that there. And it was very interesting, you know, and another great practicing, I had the honor um, to play with Chick Corea with Ayrto Moreira, the great percussionist. When we were playing trio, it's a record that's out. We played uh, and we did a lot of improvising and we did some songs that were pre, I think Ayrto had some songs, but I remember being in the studio. I don't know, did I ever tell you the story? No, I, I wouldn't have forgotten that. Yeah. So uh, we were playing the song in 5-4 and Chick was having trouble playing it. And I I couldn't believe that he would have trouble playing anything because I, I just had such high esteem. Not that someone like that can't, you know, not have something, but I saw how we got it happening within five minutes. He had it and we recorded it and it sounded like he always played it. And what he did was he, he took it apart he played it very slowly. He played the first measure and he got the fingerings. And then he said, da, 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 da. and then he played the second measure and then he played the first and the second together slowly. And then he went to the third and so on and so forth. And he played until finally he played the whole thing through, had it all together. He kept playing it faster and faster. And then it was, it was ridiculous. It was an eye opening for me because I wasn't expecting him to not be play, not be able to play anything. So, but to watch that unfold in front of your eyes must have been incredible, and it in was, front of your ears. <laughs> yes, and it, it made him human to me. <laughs> you know, is that I, recording available anywhere? Yeah, it's called Killer Bees. Okay, and is Cora Parim on it too? When I think of Air too, I can't think of one without thinking of the other. You know, I, yeah, I think Flora is on it. 
And we did a lot of improvisations. Um, I think Hiram Bullock plays on some of it. But the basic trio was with um, Ayerto and Chick and I, and then he added other people later on. Wow. That was in 1988, I think. I think it's a double record. So okay. it was something. I will have to look for that. I don't know how that uh, escaped my radar, but... Uh, yeah. You know, but, you, you said something a few minutes ago, very matter-of-factly, and it, it really got my attention. You said you drew a key... Uh, uh, fingerboard bass fingerboard and you said 24 frets which i think is very unusual given the time frame that you did this a two octave neck was was no, a, it was a fender, fender neck so it was it was uh, 22 frets okay what's a fender i don't even know now i've, I've been playing 24 yeah, well, what's an E flat, whatever that is, and I have a modulus graph that goes up to an E, but my uh, yeah. bias goes, you know, that those both I, go. I stand corrected, yeah, <laughs> but I, I just did the neck, whatever the neck was, as far as I could go. I had a Fender uh, Precision Bass, a '68 Precision at the okay. time. Okay, yeah, not, not not that I wasn't focusing on the the point of your story, oh, sure. but that just got my attention. <laughs> I'm, I'm so grooved into 24 frets now, you know. Yeah, <laughs> two octave yeah. neck. What about the future? You you mentioned that uh, you you've got another record in mind after you go like after this current one, but anything else you've always wanted to do that you haven't done yet, or anything else in the works that you know you definitely want to do? Yes, uh, I've been in touch um, with a Brazilian um, producer, uh, and I've been. Something I want to do is do a real Brazilian project. I did one record with Toninho Horta, which is called um, Beyond Words. Uh, but I want to do another one more orchestrated. I did a record uh, last year with M Luis Milan. We did a beautiful record, and it's I don't have the name of it here, but I it's a it's a really nice record, uh, and it's, it was done in Brazil in São Paulo, and I did my parts remotely from my studio, which I do a lot now. And uh, I w I, that's one project I want to do. Um, I also, interesting project coming up with uh, Adam Holtzman, the keyboard player who played with Miles Davis. Yes, I saw him with Miles. Yes. At, at, in, in Miami, what was it called? The James L. Knight Center. Oh, nice, nice. With a Schofield and, and Errol Jones and I think Al Foster. Great band. Yeah. Whoa, great band. Um, but I think this April, we're going to do an interesting project with the drummer from The Doors, John Densmore. Okay. It's going to be keyboard, bass, drums, and Arjun Brogman, the tabla player, is going to play as well. Well, what is Densmore? How did he get into that <laughs> with those other guys? It's an interesting... Uh, Adam, when he was young, his father is a record producer, and he produced the first Doors record. Okay. And he was like a studio kid that was in the studio around when they were recording all that, you know. So he was around um, all those people and became friends with John and um, Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison used to babysit for him, I think. Oh, wow. So, you know, Why? <laughs> he was at around all of that and many more recordings. Did his parents vet Morrison first before they hired him to babysit? Or... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. But uh, so he's a good friend of his. And Arjun, the tabla player, has been spending time renting a room from John Densmore out in California. So they became friends. And so we, it all became this thing. So we're going to record uh, April 1st and 2nd in Connecticut. Oh, that is exciting. It is. You know, I'm a big Doors fan, even though they didn't. Well, they did have bass on some of the recordings. Yeah. Jerry Chef, I think. Or, uh, yes. Uh, Joe yeah. Osborne, maybe. I don't know. No, I think Harvey Brooks might have done. I don't know. But uh, Jerry Chef is the first name that comes to mind. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they didn't need one for the live. I guess the keyboard, but I guess uh, Manzarek took care of it with his left hand. I don't know. <laughs> so I think, you know, I don't know. There's been talk that we're going to record a Doors song. And so that'll be great. Maybe the end or so. I don't know which one, but. Wow. Something that's a jammy type of thing for John to play on. And he wants to do a Miles Davis song as well. So we'll see. Wow. So I'm writing that. some music for that. I'm, I've got some ideas. Adam asked me to come up with some things for that. And that'll be more sketchy. 
than a through composed thing like I did on this recent record. It'll be more some sections, more like a bitch's brew thing was an idea and you go here and then eventually play this line and that sort of thing. Uh, but that I'll be continuing playing with Michael Franks. We have dates coming up this year. Okay, yeah. Um, which is I'm looking forward to. And uh, I'll be doing more recording with Danny Gottlieb, <laughs> our dynamic duo. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, well over 50 years you guys have been playing together. Yes, yes. And I'll be playing and touring and probably recording some with Pete Levin, and which is a tribute to Gil Evans. And that'll be a small, big band. And we're playing in uh, touring in Italy this summer. Tony's brother? What's it? Tony's brother? Or is it a different Pete? Tony's brother. Yeah, yeah they Tony's put out brother. a record a few years ago, a jazz record that was just fabulous. Yes, they're out touring right now. I've been following them on Facebook. They're out in the uh, on the West Oregon. He said they got two gigs canceled because of the weather. They're driving around, you know, so... But Pete Levin and I played together with the Gil Evans Orchestra in New York, and we did a lot of session work. Uh, and he's a fantastic keyboard player. Uh, so that's going to be happening. And I'm just right now. I'm just uh, settling in on what I'm going to be recording for my next record. Just thinking about that now. Okay. I still have a lot of ideas on that little voice recorder. It's uh, funny, the, the reason voice memos just came to mind so quickly, I do that too. I, you know, The more I say this publicly, the more I'm going to be committed to do it. I, I'm going to put out a record. Please. Probably, probably next year. I have a lot of material, and I do the exact same thing on my phone with the voice memos. In fact, as recently as about 30 minutes before you and I got on this interview, Really? I, That's great. And uh, they're quite, I don't have seven or 800 like you do, but I've got quite a few. And I was going through, I promised my wife over the holidays and my birthday and all that. I wouldn't work, but I said, okay, I'm just going to do some music, non, non work related. And apparently on uh, May 17th, 2018, I woke up with a jazz waltz going through my head and I sang it in. I put it in the finale and I did a, a lead sheet on it and I, I did a little, uh, you know, in, in logic, I did a little recording of it. But uh, nice. I, I'm already thinking about what tunes and, and who I want to play on it. And I cannot mention any names because those people don't even know I'm thinking about them. But right. That's great, John. I can't wait to hear it. That's awesome. I, Oh, thank you very much. So uh, thank you for indulging me. And you too, folks. Yeah. Uh, anything else, Mark, that uh, that you want to share? We've covered a lot, and this has been awesome. No, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for having for Bass Players Only. It's a great, great uh, source of great information. You guys that, you you know, that subscribe are so lucky to have John there. Thank great. you so much. Great. Thank you for your kind words. I appreciate that very much. And thanks for, for being a part of it. I'm not sure how many interviews we've done. I had uh, Stu Ham on one, one time last year, and I was telling him a story about uh, I was watching Saturday Night Live. And uh, who was the host? Was it Elliot Gould? Or, no, it, no, it was Tom Hanks. And they took him back into this room, and, and Steve Martin is there, and Elliot Gould, and somebody else, and they're wearing these fancy robes. And I'm going, I'm telling the story. I said, why am I telling you this story? It was the the five time club. So so, so I, I this is probably about the fifth time for you since 2009. I've never ever missed a weekly interview since June 15th, 2009. I have well over eight. Wow. That's <laughs> amazing. That's great. Some of them but more than once, like Stu Ham and Mark Egan. But uh yeah, so now I now I'm I mean all Al Ripken mode, I, I can't stop. So, <laughs> well, you know, there's something to be said for consistency, you know, and just keep doing what you're doing. That's great. And showing up today's world, there's so many things going on and so many distractions. And, you know, it's great when you can just like you're doing with you, you're doing your interviews and on a consistent basis. And it's the same for practicing and playing. And that's why I have that little voice recorder because, you know, if I, have an idea if i don't write it down I'm, it's probably because i'm getting old number one <laughs> but number two there's there's you get pulled in a lot of different ways especially now there's so much 
social media distraction. You're going here and there. And, you know, I think, you know, getting back to uh, suggestions for students is close the door, turn off your phone and just take the time, Take spend 20 minutes, a half hour, an hour, two hours, three hours. For me, I know to go further, if I really want to improve my playing, I have to practice three hours. That That's a point where things start to change, but you have to do it consistently. And um, I like to practice with a metronome. <laughs> so do I. I hope you're watching, Jeff Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I, I love Jeff, and I agree with him that when you're first learning something, you don't need it to have a metronome. But after you've got it under your fingers and you want to apply it to playing within a tune, if whether it's a walking bass line or, you know, a groove bass line, to play, you have to have a time. You have to have time. Time is everything to me. Yeah. And... Um, I don't mean to go off on a transit because we're just sort of signing off, but it's, it, I just, you know, it's so important. Um, and I think also it's not just playing straight ace, but to play swing time with the metronome and dividing that, you know, dividing into triplets for the metronome beat. And I'm sure you work on that. Um, the triplet division. I'm, I'm on my videos going, da, 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 as opposed to da, 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 da. And it's, uh, I was, forced into it from doing so much studio work in New York because the click track, you always played with the click, especially doing commercials and film scores. It's all timed out. So the trick was to play with it, but then be sort of free with it and, and be able to swim a little bit in the channel with the clicks. Right. Um, but Now, I know we were wrapping it up, but I've got to ask you if, if you're disciplined and you need to practice three hours, you've been playing for a lot of years, what do you practice? Good question. Um, if I don't know what to practice, what I'm gonna, what I want to practice or work on, I tend to go back to Bach and classical music. If I want to, if I really want to get my dexterity in order, and I work on the cello suites. Oh yeah, the violin cello suites. I yep, I have those. That's for violin, and then I have the um, the cello suites. Yeah, that's, well, that's both for... of those. And you know, I just pick ones that I've played, and I'll try to memorize one. And and just the the same way that Chick Career worked on that party was trying to work on, I'll I'll get a couple measures of it that I can play, and I'll add, and I'll try to make. I'll say, okay, I'm going to do the first eight bars today and I'm going to work on that and get it down and then I'll come back to the next eight bars after that and keep going so that's one way if I don't know what I'm working on but if I'm working on specific things um you know when I start to play in the morning I just like to play free I like to play whatever is in my head whether it be with a flick or with it I just like to play ideas and um I tend to practice a lot of scales and work with a lot of within a, a major scale, all the diatonic triads and all the diatonic uh, seventh chords and ninth chords and 13th chords and play those arpeggiated and work on those things. I also work a lot on melodic minor, similar in that I'll break it down into the, the diatonic triads of a melodic minor scale ascending. Is this mostly on a fretless or on a fretted? You know, I practice mostly on fretted. It's funny. I practice mostly on fretted because I, um, and then later on I'll practice fretless. Um, and then I'll work on just ideas that I have been working on myself or there's certain scales that I like a lot. And part of the, um, I'm jumping around a little bit, but also um, I'll work on a transcription of a solo of something that I really like and I'll, try to get that down i'll play along with it um so all of that takes a lot of time if you really want to do it right but it the main thing is the consistency of doing it day to day and just make sure you come back to it even if it's just a little bit a little time if you know if you happen to if you can do 20 minutes of just just the right hand exercises i have a whole thing for right hand that i, I might have talked about but 
just forget about the left hand and just how your finger and using two strings or whatever it is, it just um, string crossing exercises and to get independence and then starting on one finger and then starting on the other finger. And um, so those are some of the things that we just two fingers though, right? Yeah, but sometimes three fingers if, if I'm or thumb two, three, oh. because I've been playing some classical music ah. as well. A little bit of classical guitar, very basic sore studies. Um, I found that playing classical guitar for me opened up because the repertoire of guitar is so musical and so advanced. It, it brought my bass playing into another area of playing more Pima, you know, thumb, yeah. two, right. two. So I've been incorporating a lot of that. So you remind me, there's an outstanding book. I read it at least twice. It's uh, it's on the New York Times bestsellers list. It's called Atomic Habits, and it's all about if you can improve or increase the quality of whatever one percent a day. The way that that multiplies over not that long of a time period is. Atomic uh, Habits. James Clear, C-L-E-A-R. Nice. I yeah. will check that out. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Yeah. But well, it's, it's great to be constantly searching and trying different things. And, you know, that's the beauty of music. It's never ending. It'll never end. It's infinite and yeah. beautiful. Yes. What What is the, uh, the, the official release date of Cross Currents? Is it out yet? It is out digitally at all the uh, different digital platforms, iTunes, Amazon, Spotify, whatever. Um, the CD release street date, which actually we did release CDs, is March 8th, 2024. Okay. This is coming March. Okay. Uh, but it, it's at Bandcamp now. It's at markegan.bandcamp.com. And uh, it's also at my website, markegan.com. A whole different language we speak these days. <laughs> I know. I know. It's too much. I, I, I liked it when things were simpler. I, you know, I was, it was just easier and more focused, I think. Yeah. Do you think so? Um, yeah, but we'll say that about these days, too. I think it's good. I like good. technology, except uh, when it... Uh, I, I feel like I always have to stay one step ahead of technology because I yeah. run a long business. So, you know, I do something that I think is totally innocuous and I shut down my whole website. I've done <laughs> What? All I did was, uh, you got to help me, you got to help me. You gotta, oh. Hey, don't miss those days, and I hope they're over. Well, Mark, great to see you. Congratulations. Cross Currents is the latest record. What what number? Do you happen to know what number record that is out of all the – you had Elements and you had Mark. No, I, it's my ninth solo project, and there's about ten of Elements, other records, but of Mark Egan, it's my ninth one. I know that because all the little excerpts I put into the phone, it was like, okay, solo nine. Oh. Solo nine, solo nine. Solo nine. There you go. So, yeah. So the uh, next one will be 10. Yes. Well, highly recommend it. If you like good music and good bass playing, and it's not one of those crazy bass records. There's some great bass playing on it, but it's good stuff. Highly recommend it. Cross cards. Check it out. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, John. A pleasure. Great to speak with you. You too. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. A lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created for BassPlayersOnly.com for adults who want to play bass because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music. For BassPlayersOnly.com, this is the place to learn bass. Thanks again to my very special guest, Mark Egan. I will see you all right here, same time, same place, next week. In the meantime, let's play bass.